Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Southern Region's Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Virtual Workshop. My name is Scott Sesserich, and I'm going to go over a few items so you know how to participate for today's event. Um, so we've taken a screenshot of an example of your attendee interface. So you should see something that looks like this on your own computer desktop in the right-hand corner. Uh, right now, you're listening using your computer system by default, but if you would prefer to join over the phone, just select the telephone um, in the audio pane and the dial information will be displayed for you. Um, you can ask verbal questions today by clicking the little hand icon on your control panel and then myself will unmute you and then you can interact with today's panel. We have a good one today. Um, you'll also have the opportunity to submit text comments to the panelists by typing in your comments into the question and chat panel on your control panel. You may send in those questions at any time during the presentation, and we're going to collect them, and we're going to address them during our Q&A section of today, today's presentation. Um, there is closed captioning available. Um, there's, there's a link that I sent out through the chat box. I will send it again um, if you need closed caption for today's event. Um, and lastly, this session is being recorded. Um, so, our, so a link to the recording will be emailed to all of our participants. Um, Within the, within the coming week. And you can also locate today's PowerPoint presentation in the handout section on your control panel. Uh, so here to start things off for, day, for us today, Steve Mosier, Program Coordinator for the Innovation Center's Southern Region. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, Scott. Um, it's great to be here this morning. I'd like to say good morning to everyone and welcome to the virtual Southern Region Distance Learning Telemedicine Workshop. Um, today's um, workshop is primarily focused to bring about awareness of the DLT, our Distance Learning Telemedicine Program. Um, it is um, designed to um, bring availability of this program to you and help explore potential uses of this program to expand education and um, medical services in rural America. And lastly, it is to provide a guidance for, for submitting quality um, distance learning telemedicine applications. Um, we'd like to thank the attendees for um, taking time to be um, on this webinar, and I commend you um, for um, your efforts and what you do in uh, rural America to improve education and um, provide better medical services. Um, I would like to um, um, thank the um, members that are on the panel today. I want to thank Mr. Bill Volt, which I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, let me look and see if there's anything else I need to make sure I cover. Um, I would like to um, share with you um, the kind of the, the way the agenda is going to um, work today. Um, Mr. William Volt. Um, also known as Bill Bolt. Um, he is the GFR in uh, Louisiana and Arkansas. He is going to provide the content and the presentation today. Um, and then he'll be followed up with introductions of the uh, general field representatives that serve the Southern region. And um, they're gonna share with you um, some success stories um, and what territory that they cover. Then Sherry McCarter is going to um, share with you the question and answers that will be presented in the chat. Mr. Volt will help um, direct those questions and then we'll have some closing remarks. And with that, I'd like to um, introduce um, Mr. William Volt, um, in which I have worked with um, my entire career. Um, Mr. Volt is a graduate of, the, of Vanderbilt University in 1973. He has a bachelor's degree in engineering. Um, he, had, um, he went to work for the USDA Rural Electrification Administration right out of college. He was with them um, for 10 years as a field representative in Missouri. Um, in 1984, um, he, was, um, he changed over to the Rural Utility Service, which was part of the Farmers Home Administration. Um, he worked um, with independent telephone companies in Arkansas and Louisiana. Um, 
from that um, position, he's continued to work um, many years in the distance learning and broadband program. Uh, Mr. Vo um, resides in uh, Ball, Louisiana with his wife and he has four children. The most of all, I want to share with you um, that Mr. Volt has a um, passion for making a difference in rural America. And um, I want to thank Bill for his service um, for USDA Rural Development. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Mr. Volt. Good morning, everyone. Um, wow, I'm listening to Steve's comments and thinking that's um, fabulous. Actually, um, I, I'm the, the dinosaur in the agency. I go back so far. Um, and we'll talk about going back in just a, a slide or two. Um, as we get there, um, I want to um, note that the telecommunications program, which I'm a part of, is a part of the larger organization, Rural Development. And with Rural Development, we've got loan grants, loan guarantees in all kinds of programs for rural areas. So um, if you're looking for something in a rural area, you don't have to look far. You just take a look at the um, Rural Development webpage. It's rd.usda.gov. And you can navigate around and find uh, lots of programs that do lots of things in rural areas. Focusing on the, the one program that's um, uh, going to be of interest to us is uh, distance learning telemedicine. Um, I'm going to take a bit of a long way around to get there on purpose um, because I want to give you a feel for where that fits into um, the, the scheme of things in telecommunications. Um, I'm also going to use today's webinar um, not to uh, give you exact step-by-step um, -step detail of every part of the distance learning telemedicine um, uh, grant program, uh, what my intent to do is to um, get your appetite a little bit ready for uh, looking at it, um, point you to the information, point you to a little bit of the construction of how this is going to go together, and um, also predominantly point you to some upcoming national webinars that are taking place on the 14th and the 20th, in which case uh, the Washington staff will uh, go through the entire um, regulation, go through the entire um, application. So I'm wanting to get you ready to um, be thinking in those terms, taking a look at that for the final detail that you've got. So um, with that, um, let's take a, a bit of a, a, a trip around to get to uh, distance learning telemedicine. Um, the first stopping point is to take a look at the history we've got of where we come into today. Um, we started as an agency rural electrification in 1935 with um, forming REA co-ops around the country because rural areas didn't have reliable electric service. In 1949, that was extended to telephone service because much of rural areas in 1949 had the old magneto telephones with the cranks on them and the um, operator um, at a switchboard. Um, that through um, uh, the REA program went to multi-party service, finally to one party service, finally to digital service and now to broadband service. And each of those things were motivated by needs in rural areas. Um, there was a divide in rural areas. Um, in 1935, if you didn't have electric service, you couldn't do certain things. In 1949, if you didn't have a dialed telephone, um, you couldn't do certain things. Um, and then we had multi-party telephone service where you couldn't do banking, you couldn't do other things because there were people listening. Um, with one party service, that was kind of solved, but immediately the digital came along, in which case we had uh, certain data requirements that's been refined now into broadband service. And where that um, hits so importantly is in the needs of rural America. I might note that I go back 48 and a half years. When I started in 1973, some of the people from 1935 were still working. All of the people from 1949 were still working. And so I got to communicate and, and touch base with the people that were some of the founders in rural electrification, in rural telephony. The need is there in rural areas. It always has been in rural areas. These statistics are um, 
a little bit over a year old and um, with uh, the past year and the pandemic, um, any number you look at, it's going to get uh, higher or worse or however you want to um, express that. And the needs are there with broadband service, the needs are there in telemedicine, the needs are there in education, uh, the needs are there in tribal areas, in everything we look at, um, those needs are there. So um, here's a, a menu of some money that can help in some of those areas. First stopping point is an infrastructure program that we have, um, and this provides funding to rural independent telephone companies in order to build out, today it's broadband facilities. Um, this has been our hallmark program since 1949. Each year there's around um, $590 million that's uh, available in that program. And uh, we are using that and we are building in rural areas uh, fiber to the home facilities. Um, just as a um, generic example of that, um, we've got uh, one company that uh, today is completing their build in a, a service area that encompasses um, a couple of counties. It encompasses um, around 3,000 um, customers and uh, they have been building the last several years fiber to the home facilities. And they're offering not only uh, telephone service, but they're offering broadband service. They're offering um, some cable TV channels and the like. Um, that area is um, provided with um, service that when you talk about speeds and broadband, and we're gonna talk about certain speeds and broadband, um, you're almost only limited by the electronics that you have. And so they're offering several packages um, um, on up uh, beyond 100 meg if, if that's what you want. Um, so um, that program is around, that program continues around, applications are accepted at any time. We have a, another program through the Farm Bill. Um, it's currently under revision. Applications are not being accepted. Um, there's currently around $100 million in the hopper for when that program comes out. Uh, it may be uh, late this calendar year before there's even an application period in it because of a later program I'm going to show you. Um, but that program um, has been used in the past and um, that program can be very effective for areas that are not in the earlier program, areas that um, may not be in an independent telephone company's area, although an independent telephone company could take advantage of this program. Um, this program is, is utilized and presently I'm working with an entity that is building broadband in a five county area. Um, they're um, providing service in some um, communities that um, you've probably never heard of. They're so rural um, and they're so sparsely settled um, and they are building the thunder out of this as fast as they can build. Um, they're, they're building fiber to the home and um, they're connecting customers. Um, right now, they've got uh, a, a good problem. There are more customers coming to them for service than they had originally projected. Uh, of course, the um, past year has caused that to um, happen with more students at home, more people working at home and the like. And um, they are providing service, this one company, um, at 100 meg down, 100 meg up for about $50 a month. And um, uh, it's unusual because it's not a conventional application by a single company, but it's some companies that have um, formed a company amongst themselves, an LLC, to um, uh, be that applicant. And where that is happening is through thinking outside the box. How can we do this and how can we accomplish this? Because the motivation is, uh, to provide services in a rural area where they had been seeing a decrease in population, uh, young people leaving the area, you can't sell a house because there's no broadband. And if that continues in the future, um, they uh, look at that being problematic. So um, right now, as they build out the system, they're putting out some hotspots in rural areas. And um, I recently received word that one of the employees went out to check on the hotspot and there's cars parked there, people driving as far as 20 miles one way in order for the kids to um, be doing their homework assignments using a hotspot. So um, 
Uh, that program is around. It's called the uh, Broadband Loan and Loan Guarantee Program, also known as the Farm Bill Program. Um, we also have another program that's been around the past couple of years. It's called a Reconnect Program. It's a very popular program. Um, it's had around $600 million available in round one, round two, uh, round three is about to happen. The Reconnect Program um, brings the money through um, appropriations acts and also through the CARES Act in order to provide service in three packages, a loan, combination loan and uh, grant and a pure grant. Um, each one of these in the past has had around $200 million available. The round one applications um, have of course been uh, received, completed, announced, and we're uh, building those right now. Um, round two, uh, we're in the process of getting those started. Uh, round three is about to um, come about, and we will have um, information soon on those application windows. Um, it's uh, going to happen sometime this spring. Um, there is a um, notice on the website where um, public comments are invited because some of the um, terms of this program have now got to be codified because it's been a couple years into them. And so um, we've got that notice up there and it's available for public comment. Um, there was a webinar a couple weeks ago. It's going to be repeated in the next few days to explain uh, some of the um, items that's in there and an invitation is there for public comment. With that, I need to also give you an example, um, I guess, in the ReConnect program. And we have numerous examples of companies that have obtained funds and are building fiber to the home in areas that um, are uh, unserved by um, other providers. And so the same examples as I used earlier are present in that program. Now we're taking the long way around, we get to grant programs. And before we get to grant programs in distance learning, I wanna tell you about another grant program for broadband. It's a small program. Um, it's for areas that have no broadband facilities by any provider at the given broadband speed. Um, there's a limited amount of money nationwide. It ranges from 25 million to around 70 million each year, depending on appropriations. Um, the last window was um, uh, December 23rd of 2020. Um, those announcements have, have not been made. Um, there will be uh, another window. It uh, generally, uh, well, it will be after the first and the next fiscal year. It'll be next fiscal year's um, money that will be involved with it. And um, it has provided funding for, uh, it's for one contiguous rural geographic area that has no service by any provider. So you can draw a shape around. And we've got a number of these programs. Uh, been awarded in the states. I've been working with several of them in some very small areas, and um, it's a good way for an existing company to expand their footprint into an area that has no service and they can't economically do this without grant funds. Um, there is a 15% match requirement, um, and it's also uh, useful for um, companies or um, uh, government entities or whatever is uh, an eligible applicant to uh, furnish service in rural areas. So there's more details on these programs. Um, there will be upcoming webinars, especially on the ReConnect program as these uh, come about. Now, here's what you came to hear about today, uh, distance learning telemedicine. In 1994, um, Congress gave uh, the Rural Utility Service an amount of money. Uh, for a number of years, it was $25 million a year for distance learning and telemedicine. Um, they did not specify exactly what the program was to be used for. The agency looked around and we decided that rather than defining what the program, in other words, put the program into a box and say, you do what's inside of our box, you get our funds. Instead, we said, well, define what um, issues there are in rural areas. We won't have a box. You tell us how you can satisfy these needs through either distance learning and or telemedicine projects. And so we left that open to the applicant. And as a result, we have a whole variety of, of projects in rural areas. Um, projects in distance learning where there's a teacher in one location teaching students in other locations. 
And the program does require two-way interactive. It can't be a stored program type of thing where you're accessing just on a computer. Um, but we have students in uh, locations. We have a, a program where um, uh, nurses in a hospital have got a classroom in the back of the hospital and they're attending classes several hundred miles away at a, a college in order to get their RN degrees. We have junior colleges offering college level classes in high school. Um, on the telemedicine side, we have um, teleradiology projects. We have um, projects where they're, they're doing um, rural surgeries, uh, surgeries via uh, um, uh, somebody, uh, I guess, looking over the local surgeon's um, shoulder, a specialist. Um, we have other projects that um, uh, deal with um, uh, a doctor in a central location looking at um, rural ICU beds as well and monitoring those. So there's all sorts of potential with this that can be defined. Um, it has to be rural in nature. Um, as I mentioned, it has to be interactive to where there's a student or a patient connected with a doctor at the other end. Um, the program funds equipment only, um, equipment only, and so it does not fund things like um, salary, overhead, recurring costs, internet charges, um, building costs, or the like. It's equipment only that's connected with a distance learning and or telemedicine project. Um, there is a 15% matching requirement with it. 15% of the total project needs to be um, basically cash um, that's uh, pledged by the award, by the applicant. The 15% um, match is the same stuff as the grant would buy. So um, you can't use your match salaries, um, overheads, um, uh, uh, recurring costs, internet charges, um, uh, non-capital costs, building costs, costs unrelated to the project or so forth. Uh, so you add up the, the total of the equipment that's there, 15% needs to be as the match um, and that needs to be documented that it's available and in the general webinar they'll give you instructions on how that uh, would take place how that would go about um, so um, uh, th that's a specific thing and as we get to specific things i um, want to uh, encourage you to take a look at the general webinar um, what I'm wanting to do now is give you, first of all, a feel for the, the program, and then secondly, to also encourage you to think through the project and take a look at it to make sure, number one, it's an eligible project, and number two, with that eligible project, um, providing all the materials necessary for the agency to consider the application as complete and to score that application because it doesn't do um, either of us any good to uh, get in a hurry, put something together quickly, and then um, sometime later receive a letter that it's uh, not been considered because it's ineligible, because either things are incomplete or things are missing. I'm going to show you how to get to an application guide. That application guide is going to step you through all of the parts of the project. And so uh, my encouragement is um, if something's in the application guide, if it's mentioned there, you want to have it in your application because it's important to that application. So um, uh, let's take a look at um, some of the specifics and I want to take you through a, a build of maybe what you might consider at the very onset of considering your project. Um, the grant announcement um, appeared in the, um, on the website on uh, this past Monday, uh, there was a general application. So there's a 60 day window for applications. Um, the slide I've got in front of you is last year's slide because I don't have the current slide that uh, since the thing just came out on Monday, um, that will be in the general webinar. Um, but um, we have a window that's open. We have an application guide that was posted on Monday and we have all the information ready. Um, the deadline that's 60 days later is an absolute deadline. The grants have to be posted through grants.gov, and that deadline closes at 12 midnight 
Eastern time on that day. Um, so you have to consider your time zone calculation from that because the application window, I've had uh, people call and say, yeah, we tried to apply and all of a sudden it shut down. It shuts down at midnight Eastern time on that day. There are some changes that have took place about a year ago in order to streamline the process. Um, there's some uh, changes that also are taking place with the uh, regulation that was posted on Monday. Um, some of the changes that are taking place is to, rather than each year post the requirements or post the requirements similar to last year with some changes, um, instead, uh, the regulation now has been codified as 7 CFR 1734 um, and 1703. So um, we've got uh, requirements that um, now are in the uh, Federal Register, in the Code of Federal Regulations, and that's a handier place to have that. And then each year um, we can post with the um, uh, announcement certain other things. Um, there's some things that have been posted and uh, those are statutory changes, uh, changes in the law. Um, we don't have program appeals except for uh, two uh, cases where the applicant is a telecommunications or electric borrower. Um, uh, there is a uh, grant loan combination, but that hasn't been funded. And um, there is also a provision <coughs> for broadband facilities to be eligible if they're a part of the distance learning project and there's a limitation on the dollars. How broadband transmission facilities and everybody might be getting excited all of a sudden, now here's another way for broadband. Um, let's take an example. There's a hospital that sits a quarter of a mile off the main highway. Um, broadband has not been brought off the main line down the road to the hospital and they're told it might cost $150,000 for the provider to um, uh, bring that into the hospital. Um, that could be part of the application so long as it was under the um, percentage um, allowance um, and the grant could pay for that facility from the highway back to the hospital um, so long as the awardee, the hospital, continued to own the facilities. They can't uh, give it to the provider. Uh, the same thing might happen where we've got a campus and we've got um, some buildings and we don't have connections between the buildings. So um, there's a limitation to that. There's also some environmental um, information in the application that would need to be provided with that. There's some non-statutory changes and those, those deal with uh, the scoring criteria and um, those will be updated as the um, each year the announcement is made and um, that has been updated and let me mention uh, a few of the major um, changes that we'll find this year if you're familiar with the program in past years um, one thing that's there this year that you'll see more detail in the national webinar is that the applicant must own the equipment um, so um, they can't utilize uh, third parties. And where this might call into play is um, in the past, we've maybe seen hospital and then the hospital's got a foundation. The foundation applies for and manages the grant, but the hospital's actually the one that has the equipment and um, maintains it and continues with it. Um, with this scoring criteria, um, they have to make a choice. Who is it that's going to um, own the equipment, um, most likely it might be the hospital would have to apply. Um, there's also in the past been some additional scoring points that have been awarded for opportunity zones, for STEM projects, where that's the predominant part of the project, for opiate projects, where that's the predominant part of the project. Um, and um, uh, opportunity zones have been eliminated, STEM has been eliminated, opiate continues, and also there's a change if there is a, um, a tribal entity involved and that has to be uh, absolutely identified and um, where the um, additional points are 10 points for opiate, there's 20 points for the tribal side. Um, there's a change we'll see in the economic need calculation and I've got a sample of that upcoming. Um, there's also a change that uh, an applicant can make multiple um, applications but would receive only one award 
based on their highest scoring application. So um, if uh, somebody uh, provides three applications, we would score all three of them, but they could only get one award. Uh, just a note, the awards are, are based on scoring criteria, not based on any other factors. So we start each year from the highest score. We work our way down the list until we run out of money. Um, so it's all based on a score and um, we're going to examine now a little bit how that scoring can take place. You want to go to our website. There's a couple of ways you can go to USDA.gov. Um, I'm going to show you one way. Um, sometimes the screens change a little bit, but um, all you have to do is go to rd.usda.gov and um, click on programs and services and um, find something that says telecommunications programs on down the list. Or if the main page of what you're looking for someplace says telecommunications programs, that would be the place to go. Once you get to telecommunications programs, you scroll down the page a little bit, and this is just the text from the page that I captured, and it's got the four programs, and they should be familiar because I've just gone through those four programs for you. Um, when you get to uh, distance learning telecommunications grants, you click on that and um, uh, it will come as a default, the overview tab, click on to apply. And um, this hasn't been updated since Monday, but there'll be a place where the application guide is. There's some application guide worksheets and um, so forth. That's the place where you want to be. Um, you'll also look at that page to find where um, the webinars are located. And um, also there's a useful place. Um, you can file uh, questions you've got with the help desk as well as um, where we'll talk about later your local general field representative. Um, if you take a look at the contact us either on the left or the far right, um, you can click on that tab, scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, put your email address in and you will find a place where you'll be notified anytime that's happening with anything in the program. Rurality is important. You have to have sites identified. There's a site worksheet that I, I'm not showing you a copy of, but on that you've got the address and the location of each of the sites that you're intending to have. There's a definition hub and hub end user. You identify now each one according to those definitions. Um, basically the hub site is a place where medical or educational services can take place but there aren't any patients or students there. And a hub site where that's important is that could be in a urban area. An end user site is an area where the patients or the students are located. Um, so um, uh, let's give uh, an example. Um, in Arkansas, a hub site could be Little Rock, which is an urban area, it's a city. Um, but if the teacher is there, um, that allows the um, grant to take the um, advantage of educational opportunities in larger areas. An end user site might be a, a very small town outside of Little Rock, um, a town of maybe a um, couple hundred population where the school is, and that's where the students are. So you have a teacher in Little Rock interactively dealing with students in a small town. Um, the hub would be Little Rock, the end user would be the small town. If there were students in the classroom also in Little Rock, then that becomes a hub slash end user, and we would um, have to identify that as such. Where this comes into play is when we do our scoring. In my first example, um, I had, uh, well, a small town, let's add two towns. Uh, and they're very small, so they score the maximum amount, 40 points. The hub is Little Rock. It scores zero. But because there are no students there, it's a pure hub. We have 40 plus 40 is 80 divided by 2 is 40. We have a maximum rurality score. If we have students in the classroom in Little Rock, that score of zero now is added in. So we've got zero plus 40 plus 40 is 80 divided by 3. So we've dropped from 40 points to 26.7 points. Um, the minimum score for an eligible grant is 20 points. Um, it's very important to uh, self-score your points. 
and to realize these points are going to go into the calculation because you're competing with all the other applicants as far as getting high scores. So rurality scores in that way. There's another worksheet, economic need. Um, again, we list our sites, um, hubs, and, and users as well. And here's the sheet from last year. And um, uh, what is the um, designation where we have signage, where we put the circle and the big uh, red line through it? Don't use this one. Use the one from the current year. So here's something where last year we had, depending on percentages that we get from census information, SAIPE scores, um, which deal with uh, percent uh, of poverty in uh, rural areas. Um, the last year we added all that up um, and we used a scoring of 10, 20, or 30 points depending on the range. Um, this year, those, that 10, 20, 30 goes away, and it's actually the average score that's going to be used there. Um, so um, it's an important point for me to make, a stopping point for me to make right now, um, because if you've been involved in the program, familiar with the program in the past, gotten a grant in the past, um, that knowledge is important, that experience is important. Um, in fact, the, the things that you're doing is important. However, you need to take a look at the current application guide and make sure you're following that and not just something you've done in the past. Because if you, um, you know, mess this one up or you leave out some of the things or you score improperly, um, you could be either ineligible or you could score not the way you, you think you'd want to score with it. Economic need is going to be very important. Um, another one um, of the spreadsheets that you find, it's not part of the scoring, but it's the budget worksheet. For each of the sites that you've identified, um, you need to have a description of what a budget item is. Um, it could be a um, camera, it could be a classroom configuration, it could be a medical cart or something like that. Have unit costs and um, a extended cost for that. Of that total, then 15% needs to be um, a, a match. Um, for uh, having uh, more match than that, there's no advantage, there's no additional point scoring that's um, for uh, greater than 15% match. Um, I've seen over the years some budgets that are very granular um, and some budgets that are very um, general. Um, when uh, an awardee receives an award and they um, go into the, the purchasing of equipment and getting reimbursement, um, we're always looking at the budget. We're not wanting to overspend the budget. So as an example, suppose there's a computer system in the budget. And so somebody lists line item number one, CPU, number two, monitor, number three, mouse, number four, keyboard, number five, um, power cord, number six, um, uh, cable to the monitor. Um, and uh, so we've got six budget items. When we get ready to buy the thing, um, we go in the store and it's all in one box. It's called computer system. So now you've got a computer system that's actually your budget is a little bit too granular because instead of having all six items broken out, you could use line item one, computer system, and list a unit cost for that. So you don't want to get... Um, overly general, but you don't want to get so granular that you've got cords and cables and plugs and things like that um, that you want to struggle with later. Um, so it's important to develop a budget and develop a budget that also has shipping costs in it, that has um, maybe what you're expecting for inflation. Um, you want to have your budget based on something. You can add sheets in your application showing how you got these numbers, how these numbers came about. Um, if you're taking a look at a certain product, when we come to purchasing later with the awardees, we don't care the name that's on the product. It's not important to us. Um, so uh, you could like a certain manufacturer right now. When you get done, you could uh, like somebody else's manufacturer. Also, we note that the purchase under the grant is subject to the um, grant requirements under 2 CFR Part 200. And at certain points, um, the uh, of, of dollars, it needs to be a competitive bid with the um, procurement. 
There's part of the um, application that you'll see that's called an application checklist. Um, that's to make sure you've got all of the parts of the application put together. Um, and an important part of the application is going to be your general description because there are points um, connected with the subjective scoring of what does this do for the area? What does this do for the people in the area? Um, subjective scoring is going to be very important, but also this needs to be part of the application because there's a certification at the bottom. There's certain um, assurances and certifications that you check and by checking those and signing the certification you're at the bottom, you're actually signing those specific certifications. You apply through grants.gov. When you get to grants.gov, all it shows up is a standard form 424. You put in the information and then people call me and say, well, what about all the other stuff you're asking for? If we look at the bottom of the second page of the form, at the very bottom, it says add attachments. You click on that and it opens up a window where you can put in different attachments. Um, you could put in one application, attachment that's a PDF that's got all your stuff in it, or you could put in a number of application um, attachments that's each part of it, the executive summary, um, the scoring sheets, and so forth. Um, uh, it's a little bit easier to navigate the ladder, but that's up to you how you present the information. And then finally, um, you uh, provide contact and a uh, signature on it, and you file it by the deadline. Um, I want to take a look at, um, as we uh, get ready for some um, wrap up uh, information and some questions, um, I want to take a look at historic numbers. I need to jump ahead in that. Um, and we've got uh, around $8 billion invested currently in rural America. Um, we've got a number of projects in each state. Um, if you want, your local GFR can get you state numbers on how much has been um, invested. Um, that goes along each year, and we continue to invest heavily in rural America, and that's what it's all part of. That's through um, grants, through loans, through um, other projects. Um, so let's continue now and take a look at, well, who is it? You've been seeing my face um, uh, for um, almost 45 minutes now. Um, if we can, we'll um, open it up that maybe you'll see uh, the faces of some of the other general field representatives that are around. Here's a map showing um, uh, the nationwide coverage of GFRs. Most of us um, cover multiple states. Um, uh, many of us live in, in very rural areas as well. Um, prior to the pandemic, we traveled multiple areas. Um, in my 48 and a half years, I've not been confined to Louisiana and Arkansas either due to vacancies. Um, you may have seen me in your area as well. Um, uh, there's an old um, country music song, um, I've been everywhere, man, I've been everywhere. And um, I've been through um, with uh, the agency over the years, uh, I think 48 of the 50 states. So you may have run across me. Um, here's contact information for um, each of the GFRs. And um, we've uh, unfortunately not been able to have everyone online uh, today, um, but we've got uh, several of the GFRs around. And I'd like to take a moment now um, in going through um, uh, the GFRs and um, ask each one of them to give you um, just a, a minute or two of um, uh, who they are, where they're located, the town they're located in, um, and also if they would just highlight, uh, not naming places and people and, and companies, but highlight what distance learning telemedicine has done in the areas that they serve. Um, so um, uh, let's start with James Wilson in Kentucky. And James, um, would you unmute and um, give us a, a little capsule? Okay, uh, can you hear me, Bill? Yes. Okay, excellent. So uh, again, I'm James Wilson. I cover the state of Kentucky. I do reside in Lexington, Kentucky, and um, uh, sort of like Bill, I've, I've covered quite a few states: Ohio, Indiana, and Tennessee, most recently. Uh, but have said, you know, settled working with Kentucky. Uh, as far as the DLT project example, um, I've got one uh, sort of in the southeastern part of the state that is a uh, sort of an aggregation of several different. Uh, 
project types. They are doing uh, it's a, a clinic, sort of a regional clinic that operates. Uh, they ha are doing sort of satellite offices with either nurse practitioners or, or PAs uh, in other regions, uh, other smaller uh, communities, also have uh, presence in nursing homes, and a lot in the schools, doing the, the school health system. And in that region of uh, Appalachia, uh, that is a, a sorely needed um, uh, service to be offered and, and gives the some of the students access to healthcare that may not be able to access healthcare outside of the school uh, environment. Okay, thank you, James. Um, okay, mm -hmm. next on the list is um, Shannon Legree. Um, Shannon, unmute your microphone and, and tell us um, where you're located and, and uh, highlights in your area. Thank you, Bill. Good morning. Again, my name is Shannon Legree, and I'm a general field representative covering North Carolina and South Carolina. I currently reside in Columbia, South Carolina, um, physically. Uh, one example of a great project that we've uh, had here in the state of South Carolina is we actually made a, um, a DLT grant to one of the uh, medical facilities here. And they partnered with one of the school, uh, with, with the school district in one part of the state here, in which they located telemedicine equipment there. And they also did distance learning. From the telemedicine standpoint, they had a nurse on staff within the schools. And the nurse was able to actually see children um, if they had any type of illness or anything of that nature. She also had contact with physicians at the hospital. So if there was anything that she was unable to diagnose, that physician could diagnose it themselves via telemedicine. Also, they were able to call in prescriptions at the local pharmacies and so forth for those children. At that point in time, they would also contact the parent. So thus, they were saving that parent time from getting off work and taking that child to the doctor in addition to them losing income um, uh, with this example itself, they saved them that time, they saved them the income, and they were able to diagnose that child and then let the child, parent come and pick up that child and take that child home. The same client also used um, distance learning. They had a nutritionist, nutritionist that was working with the children. They taught them about healthy eating and exercising. And the great concept about this was that those same children um, as they learned these concepts themselves, they took this and they took it, they took these concepts and they took them home and they applied them to their everyday living and their lifestyles, not just for themselves, but still for their parents as well. So that was a great example of how a distance learning and telemedicine program has worked here within the state of South Carolina um, so far as well. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Shannon. And now, um, Andy Hayes, um, Andy, where are you located at and, and give us a, a detail in your area. I am located right now in Jacksonville, Florida. I used to be located um, in Georgia in between Atlanta and Macon. Um, and that's because I cover both Georgia and Florida as well as the US Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So, um, and like Bill said, also I've occasionally um, gone into Alabama and South Carolina to do some, some temporary fill-ins when, we, when we've had vacancies. So the, um, the project that I wanna to highlight today is one that uh, started in 2018. It's a telemedicine project, basically using um, the standard portable telemedicine cart and two main peripherals, which would be an ultrasound probe and a laryngoscope. Um, basically, the project was meant to um, hook up an urban hospital to several rural hospitals. And the, the unique thing about this project, well, basically, the, the, the main goal was to provide remote medical specialist uh, consultation support to the rural medical staff so that when an emergency patient came in, they could have some help in the consultation to decide whether or not to keep that patient in the local hospital or to transfer them to the urban hospital and the problem was prior to the uh, grant project without the extra medical consultation help if they didn't immediately if it wasn't obvious to them that they knew they could treat the patient they just went ahead and for precautionary purposes transported them to the urban hospital so prior to our project I think a lot of patients were transferred unnecessarily which of course is bad for the patient but also, um, it didn't allow the rural hospital to keep the patient and the associated patient revenue, which is, which is vital to our rural hospitals. I was just looking at it today. 42 hospitals across the country with bankrupt just 
last year in 2020. So, um, but the interesting thing with this um, uh, project also was the use of ultrasound probes. Uh, at first I thought, um, you know, they're basically just used for pregnancies, but then found out they're used for a whole bunch of other, um, you know, heart disease, stroke, kidney and gallbladder um, disease, just a lot of stuff. Also being portable, um, you can take them into the emergency room to be used for patients that can't be transported, even, you know, they're so badly hurt they can't even be transported maybe to another room. So the portable uh, equipment really is, that's its advantage over the old, uh, older fixed, you know, big, large units that are also more expensive. Um, and then the other peripheral was the laryngoscope, which, you know, at first we thought it was just going to be used for anesthesiology and general surgical procedures, but then COVID hit. Um, and basically, the, basically the laryngo laryngoscope is where the, um, you can look at the throat, and the one that is in this project is a video, flexible video laryngoscope, where the remote specialist can actually help the, um, the local hospital staff do the intubation, which is putting the, uh, the tube down the throat into the airway, which is necessary to hook them up to a ventilator, which of course is vital today with COVID. So um, that's my project that I thought was very interesting. Okay, thank you, Andy. Um, so, we take a look at um, all of this stuff, and if you're looking in the background behind me, you see stacks of paper. Stacks of paper still around. Uh, now it's also electronic files uh, filled in the computer, um, and we have applications, we have reports, we've got all sorts of things. Uh, we've got um, equipment we talk about, we talk about budgets, um, and then it gets down to a personal level as well. Um, it was um, a while back that um, a gentleman that I, I know, um, his name's Daryl, um, he went out to check the mailbox and the neighbor looked out and Daryl checks the mail every day after the postman comes by. He said, it's unusual. He opened up the mailbox and he just sat down on the curb and he stayed there. The neighbor went out and said, are you okay? And he was muttering, the neighbor called 911 and from the time the ambulance showed up at the house, um, Daryl was connected to networks and to specialists, um, both within the ambulance ride when he got to the hospital. The hospital, when they wheeled him in, they already had his um, electronic medical records up. They already had the profile there and they were connected to a specialist in New Orleans. And um, so they treated his, his stroke um, uh, just about immediately, and um, uh, Daryl um, had a, a full recovery not very long after that. So when it, it comes to a personal level, yes, all the paper, all the applications, all of this stuff is necessary, and it gets down to the people and what's happening in um, both here with Daryl and um, other states where you've got um, patients in ICU, um, all of a sudden, the doctor's calling saying, go, go down to bed number three. You need to take this with you because the computer profile has said this stuff. Um, lives are being saved in rural areas. Um, the thing, same thing happens with students where we can have students connected to um, uh, teachers remotely. Um, maybe even, as I mentioned, uh, where students go to a remote hotspot right now, that's a temporary thing till they get fiber to the home. Students are being connected, education is taking place, and that's just so very important in our rural areas. So um, let me take us back now. Um, I gotta back up a couple of slides. And um, I think, Sherry, you're gonna introduce the question portion of the um, session. Yes, Bill, that's correct. Um, and I wanna, first of all, thank you for a fantastic presentation and um, sharing your many, many years of experience. Um, before we do that, um, uh, Bill, if you would, I remember last year as we were touring the state of Arkansas and doing many in-person, and then later on we did a virtual um, presentation, um, but we, you talked about the importance of SAMS and DUNS number and about if you do not have a current SAMS and DUNS, how essential it is that's the first step you need to do because um, you don't want to get down to getting ready to submit your application and you're waiting on those. So would you mind yes, covering that? And then I'm going to introduce yeah, Sherry yes. 
and we'll start it's the so question and answer. It, it's so important to have um, things looked at ahead of time. Um, and the application requires a DUNS number for the um, uh, applicant. And the DUNS number is something that you can get for free, something you can get. I just made somebody unhappy. Um, something you can get, but you have to have a DUNS number. You also have to register through SAM, um, System of Award Management, SAM.gov. And that can take a few days to navigate through. So you don't want to wait till the end of that. Um, and also you want to check carefully what's in the application guide, because not only do you need a SAM registration for the entity, but the SAM registration needs to also have portions of it completed for financial assistance, which is more of an application in SAMs than the basic thing. Um, so these things need to be done in order to um, have a complete application, and um, these things need to be worked on ahead of time. Um, each year we've got several um, that are rejected because um, uh, what there's several entities and they get the numbers for the wrong entities. We check this, and it's got to be the uh, registrations for the entity that's the applicant. Um, okay, Sherry, we're ready for questions. Yeah. Um, I I want to introduce um, Sherry McCarter. Um, Sherry is a colleague of mine. Um, she helps me ha cover the South. She's located in Tennessee, and she is a um, partnership liaison specialist. Um, and Sherry's going to ask the questions, and Bill's going to help direct them. As we ask the uh, questions, this is an interactive part, Bill. This is where the audience um, has access to all these great minds here at the top of the screen that um, know that the distance learning telemedicine program inside and out. How you um, go about um, asking your question, if you will, you see this um, this blue line uh, where it says you can submit comments or questions in the chat section. Um, what you do is you go in and you just merely type in your question and hit send and it um, goes forward and um, Sherry will will read the question and interact with Bill as far as uh, the direction it needs to go. Some questions may come in, and if they're high technical level, they may need to go to the national office. Um, if they are specific to a particular area or state, um, Bill may want to direct it that way. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry McCarter. Thanks, Steve. We've got several questions already in the question box, so I'll start with the first one. And Bill, this person would like for you to discuss the adjacent communities of 50,000 plus from the Rurality Worksheet. Um, they'd like to know, um, like to hear your explanation on how that factors in. And okay, that, we've got the question is from uh, slide 21. Okay, we've got um, a number of um, uh, rural census areas. Um, if you uh, take a community, you look up at the census, you see what their census is, and there's some numbers associated with it. Um, there are also some communities that are right there upon urban areas that. Um, Maybe even when you're in the urban area, you don't know you went from um, one uh, the city to uh, something that that one city. Um, uh, for example, uh, Baton Rouge, um, Louisiana. Um, the um, boundaries bounce around a little bit, and there's some other areas that are um, uh, well. One is a community that's right there by the mall in uh, Baton Rouge. And well, that's part of Baton Rouge, actually, even though it's a separate entity. So um, there are some um, areas that are um, adjacent to urban areas that are excluded from this because they're just urban in nature. That's that's my general um, answer. Um, I think if you take a look at the application guide, that's going to be explained in greater detail how you determine what those areas are. And in the uh, 
national webinar, Richard's going to explain that in detail as well. Um, how you can determine if something that's sitting right upon a um, uh, urban area is actually urban or, or rural. Um, so um, that's kind of a general um, answer to it. Um, uh, James, uh, Shannon, Andy, do you have any additional detail? I don't, Bill. I, I think you explained it very well. Uh, you know, it's just a little bit of lag sometime in the classification of a geographic region that's really close to uh, to an, a, a large urban area. And so, yeah. Uh, yeah and, and I guess we can name some of those examples. Um, you know, Oklahoma City, no, it's all Oklahoma City. It, it's a huge um, urban area. Um, when you get to Houston, though, you've got places like Sugar Land, uh, that, that's just right right there on Houston. And so um, uh, you know, some urban areas are split up depending on how the, the geography happened over the years. And we do have a map where you can actually, if you have any doubts about um, where your sites are, we have a map where you can actually plug in the physical address of your map and zoom right in and it'll show you if it's in an urban area or not. So if it's in an urban area, regardless of the population of that community, it'll be treated like an urban area. And if it's an end user site, it'll receive a score of zero. Um, or if it's a hub in a non-fixed project, it will receive zero. So it's important to check that up front. Okay. Um, Terry, uh, next question. Okay. The examples we've seen so far seem to emphasize examples where equipment purchases are made on both ends, rural site and hub. Are projects eligible for equipment purchases for hub equipment, which would be used to meet with patients who are at home? Okay, um, two parts to that uh, question. Um, the first part is, um, you can't just fund hub facilities. Um, you've got to have something happening in rural areas. Now, you could have an anomaly where we want to um, have a, a junior college have classrooms and the high schools have already got their equipment. Um, that would be a good question for the helpline. Um, in other cases where we're just buying things for um, to equip a hub site, um, that's problematic because you have to have two-way interactive uh, telemedicine or distance learning. Um, now, the other part of the question um, deals with what might be called a home health system um, in one example. Um, we've got equipment in the hospital and um, we've got some units that we put in patients' homes to monitor home health. Um, it may be through a home health nurse uh, association that that's done. And um, so this is scattered all over, let's say the county. Um, and so we've got uh, 20 units we're gonna scatter around. Well, how do we put uh, end user locations where uh, this month it may be at grandma's house, next month it may be at Aunt Minnie's house. Um, in that case, the um, application guide takes us to a scoring where we use the location where the equipment is stored as the site. So um, in this case, it may be that um, uh, hospital site or the home health nurse location, and that becomes the um, scoring site for the equipment. Um, now, the problem comes in, where is that site? Um, we've got one successful site where the location is stored at, um, scored well, it's a, a rural hospital. Um, let's take right here at home, Alexandria, Louisiana, if we're wanting to uh, scatter equipment all around the parish and Alexandria is the home to it, well, Alexandria doesn't score 20 points. It's an urban area. So um, that scoring criteria is explained in, in the guide and that can um, happen to where we have um, equipment uh, dispersed with either students or with um, Healthcare providers. Andy, Shannon, James, anything else? 
No, you pretty much summed it up very well, Bill. That wasn't a summary. That was too long to be called a summary. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing okay. I would add, and I, and I just had this uh, conversation not too long ago, is that we've been getting lately because of COVID, a lot of these types of projects where we do have a hub site um, that's providing uh, services to homes due to COVID, specifically due to COVID. And those applications are basically for maybe a hub site that's a, a school um, trying to provide services to students that are basically in the same community. And it sounds like this, this question, this hospital might be trying to provide services to homes in the same community. And even though these projects may be eligible, I don't think they're gonna score very high because they're not, the objective of the program is to bring resources, educational and medical from outside the community. Um, but COVID has kind of twisted things around where if there's a need to also deliver it virtually from within the community, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't really fit what we're trying to do with this program, even though it's something that's needed because of COVID. So that's, that's a struggle we're having to deal with lately. Yes, thank you for adding that. Okay, Sherry, next question. Next question. Who is the GFR for California and Nevada? Okay, um, according to the map, that's going to be Robert Machado, who's also listed as Oklahoma. And Robert was recently in Oklahoma and he accepted the position as um, uh, the GFR retired in California. So um, if you take a look at the map and you can get also this information by uh, clicking on um, the um, uh, map under contact us, looking up GFRs and you'll get all of that information. Um, here's Robert's contact information uh, if you want it right now. And Robert is also going to be hosting um, a, a DLT webinar, I believe, Bill, out there in the West. So you can email um, and get that information from Robert. Um, we worked with him last year on our virtual um, three state regional uh, DLT presentation. Okay, Sherry, do we have another question? We do. If our company is based out of one state but is doing business in rural areas in several states, what state should we apply for and can we apply in multiple states or does it matter? Okay, um, an application is not subject to state lines. Uh, we have many applications that um, go across state lines for end user sites and, and so forth. Um, uh, take an example, Texarkana, Arkansas or Texas. Um, and the state line goes through the middle of the town. You can have a project there in dealing with two states. Um, so the um, applicant has a physical address and that's what they're using as their application. Um, now this applicant, um, let's again take Texarkana, uh, they want to apply for two grants um, because in um, the program this year, the minimum amount of grant is $50,000, the maximum amount is a million dollars. Uh, suppose they're over a million dollars, so they split it in two, and the applicant uh, divides it, one application for Arkansas, one application for Texas. As I mentioned earlier, um, we'll score those applications if they're eligible, and the highest scoring application would be the one that goes on the list, and we worked on the list to see if, if that would be awarded. So they can only get one award even though they could apply multiple times. Andy, Shannon, James. Uh, here in Kentucky, I mean, we've seen uh, several applications come in where the, the entity may be out of state serving sites in Kentucky, or um, a lot of them, in, particularly in the Eastern region, um, may run, be based out of a, a, one of the larger communities in the Eastern, Eastern Kentucky that serve sites over in West Virginia, Virginia area. So that, that's a typical, uh, fairly common occurrence. Uh, as Bill said, you, just, you, you know, you have the organization's headquarters, the applicant's headquarters, uh, but you, know, you can have sites across 
um, you know, several states. It's just as the project di dictates. Yeah, and part of the thing is to decide who is the applicant, uh, because we may have four entities, and well, one of them is the applicant. Um, you can have a consortia. Where you want to uh, look carefully at what the description is of consortia, um, but somebody needs to be the financial um, manager for the project as well. Next question. Next question. This is in regards to distance learning. Can there be a blend of in-person lecture in conjunction with online course material and lecture? If so, what does that percentage look like? 50-50, 75-25, your thoughts? Let me start and then we'll go around to the others. Um, the project should be two-way interactive distance learning. When I was a kid in school, uh, we had classroom learning and the teacher in front, and every once in a while, the teacher would get out um, the old eight millimeter um, uh, movie uh, projector and we'd see a, a film about something um, in order to enhance the classroom experience. Um, but we need to have a system where it's two-way interactive distance learning right now. Let me go around to the others and let them add to it as well. James. Yes, I mean, as Bill said, I mean, you can have a blend where, where the, the instructor originating the, the educational content does have a class uh, physically in front of, of that, that individual. Uh, but you also, as Bill highlighted in, 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 in detail, you need that two-way connectivity with off-site uh, classrooms. And they may not have the teacher there, they may just have the, the, the uh, sort of the audio-visual equipment and, and or computers or what. But you have to have that sort of synchronous communication type where the students in those off-site locations can interact real in real time with the uh, educator there at the class. So it, it's not necessarily a percentage, um, but the, there needs that, that two-way synchronous communication pathway is, is key to, to having a successful project, an eligible project. Yeah, now the um, session could be recorded as, oh, did we mention this session is being recorded um, and viewed later, um, and that's still part of part of education, um, but um, the overall is is the importance of two-way interactive. Um, Shannon, anything to add? Uh, it's just what you stated, Bill, is definitely correct. We don't have a definitive percentage um, per se, but there must be interaction between the instructor and the student. Um, that's the premise behind the distance learning. You can have those pre-recorded sessions in which they may watch a 10 or 15 minute video, but they must have some interaction between themselves and the students for it actually be to really be considered distance learning. Uh, the same can be said when it comes to the uh, telehealth portion of our program as well. They must have that. They must be able to talk with a physician if it's telehealth. And they must be able to talk with an instructor for the distance learning component as well. Okay. Yes, and um, also. Um, the uh, there's limits on instructional programming and, and that's contained in the application guide, how much of the funding can be for that. Um, okay, Andy, anything to add? Well, just, I think we basically covered it. Um, when, I, when I think of in-person, I guess it used to be, you know, the teachers physically in the classroom with the students, like you said, but I consider in-person now distance learning because if you can, if you can see them and you can speak with them, I mean, it's that's the whole purpose of this. They're almost as though they're in the same room with you. So that's my definition as far as our program goes on in-person instruction. And as far as online, to me, that's just simply like an, an online course where you're not really interacting with anybody. You're just, you're just taking the class online. And of course, that can be used as a supplement to these, to these uh, to our program, but it can't be the primary way that students learn or that anybody accesses information. It's got to be primarily, like Bill has said, everybody said, live interactive two-way with some supplemented online coursework, whether that's 
a previously recorded distance learning session that students can go back and rewatch or some type of other online supplementary material. And like uh, James said, we don't really have, you know, a written ratio for that, but the projects primarily have to be live interactive two way. Okay, Sherry, next question. Next question. Can you help clarify the extra SAM section you mentioned during the last part of the webinar? We contacted the SAM help desk about this requirement and were told we were up to date but we were deemed ineligible with this uh, following message. The system for award management registration for the name and DUNS number provided in your application lacked financial assistance representations and certifications as required by section E4. Okay, and that E4 reference is in our application guide, I believe, to where the SAM system, when we uh, take a look at the SAM registration, um, it needs to not only be a registration, but you can scroll down and you can see financial representations. So uh, apparently that wasn't there, and that's an added thing that somebody has to do in SAM. Um, I don't know if you can see it in your own registration. Uh, the SAM registration is, of course, separate from our agency and is, is um, um, overseen by, by, that, uh, by that group. Um, can anybody else add anything to, to help with this? I know that what we're looking for is called the Financial Assistance Certification Report. And I, I haven't been in SAM. I don't know how the, the process is once you get in it, but that's the report we're looking for when we pull up your SAM information um, that we see that you have checked the box and certified, you gotten this report from them. It's called the Financial Assistance Certification Report. That's all I have to add. So that's part of the um, registration with SAM. So um, yeah, what the, the comment you got back was is, is the SAM registration is incomplete as far as financial assistance part. Um, so that that's, I guess, all we can do is, is point you back to that. Okay, Sherry. Bill, there are no more questions in the box. Okay, so now it's time to see if anybody wants to raise their hand and actually speak to us. Yes, Bill, that's you're absolutely correct. So um, there is a uh, raise your hand feature. Um, Scott, would you mind um, kind of covering that, um, how that, that process works? Scott, I don't know if your mic's well, on. Scott, no. Yep, sorry about that. I need to was there. Yeah, uh, so no. they, yeah, um, I don't see any um, hand raises right now in the audience, but I do want to show the audience. Um, as you can see on the slide, there's a little hand icon um, right in your right on the on your control panel. If you go ahead and click that icon, that'll virtually raise your hand, and then I'll be able to unmute you from the other side, and then you can interact with uh, James, Andy, and Shannon, Steve, and Bill. So if you have a question, we'd like to encourage you guys, go ahead and send those questions either via chat, but um, if you wanna talk verbally, that's totally, that's great, and go ahead and use that hand raise feature um, that's located on your panel. Currently, I don't Thank see you, any, Scott. no problem. And as of right now, Currently, I still, you don't uh, see any hand Hands raised. Oh, oh, actually, yes, we do have one. All right, thank you. All right, so Sharon Smith, you can go ahead and uh, pose your question. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. This has been very informative and I appreciate um, the presentation. I'm fairly new to this. I work for the Albemarle Commission Regional Council of Government in Northeastern North Carolina. 
Um, and so my, but my question is kind of broad. Um, we've been trying to help our member governments um, figure out the broadband expansion issue. And one thing that we keep coming up against is that a lot of the funding depends on the FCC maps and, um, excuse me, and they're just not right. Um, so I wasn't sure and I wanted to ask if you all are seeing that in any that problem in any of your regional areas, your rural areas, um, and you know what we can do to get around it, I guess, uh, short of you know doing our own study, because we know our people aren't being serviced by these big companies who say they actually are servicing our areas. Thank you. Okay. There's a two part answer. I'll, I'll start the first and we'll see if someone wants to jump in with the rest. Um, the broadband programs that we have use um, all sorts of information to determine if there is broadband available in the area. And the FCC reports are not the singular nor the sole source nor um, uh, considered the um, uh, factual source. Uh, the applicant is responsible for presenting a proposed service area in which it's um, unserved or underserved, meaning at the broadband speed, uh, uh, less than 10% of the households receive service at that speed. Um, so they present that information and then the agency will use uh, various tools in order to verify that information, including an on the ground review of it. So just because the FCC or somebody else says there's service, no, it's actually what is provided, what is present. Now, there are some um, uh, mapping endeavors underway. Um, Arkansas has an online map where they um, pinged several um, million uh, computers and they've got a map showing speeds and providers. I believe Pennsylvania's done the same. Um, there is also, um, uh, NTIA, I think, is the agency that has a mapping initiative underway. I haven't been as close to the information. Um, hopefully, one of the others can jump in that has been closer to that information. Well, I have, uh, from my standpoint, I've been closer to that information, but I do know that the North Carolina Great Grant, they've got their maps for where, they, where the funding has been provided for those providers where services has been expanded for broadband activity as well. And Bill, you, what you alluded to with NITA is correct. That's a new endeavor which they're gonna be putting forward um, for their mapping systems also. Okay. Yeah, I can jump in on that, Bill. I've been kind of doing uh, something with the NTIA's uh, national broadband map where, yeah, they have FCC data, they also have data that's uh, contributed by the states if the state has any funding programs or if they've spent any money to do their own mapping. Um, that the NTIA's mapping tool also has um, OOKLA data from users who have who've done speed tests and also information from another website called MLabs um, where they do some speed testing. Uh, so there's a lot of data on that map. Um, and yeah, just because any of those sources suggest that there's um, broadband in an area, that doesn't necessarily mean it's so, or that doesn't necessarily mean the house next to that has um, service. So when we go out and look for uh, check areas that need funding, where applicants are requesting funding, we have to actually go out on the ground, contact the, the uh, incumbent providers themselves and do speed testing. So yeah, basically online research to determine where service is and is not is, is very difficult. But in terms of this program that we're talking about, um, up to 20% of the grant amount under this program can be used for broadband facilities. And so regardless of whether there's generally high speed in the area, you may have a hub, hub site or an end user site that does not have access. Um, and we can, you can use the, the grant funds to provide uh, to connect that site to the internet, whether that's a wireless connection or a fiber connection, um, doesn't matter. Okay, um, Sherry, anybody else bold enough to raise your hand? 
Um, I can't tell if anyone else has their hand raised, but we do have a comment. It's not a question, but it's just a note uh, to let us know that uh, someone had a horrible experience getting Sam to work because of the same FAC issue that's being talked about. Uh, being in a rural area, being rural, uh, it's 10 times harder to complete because our address was not registering as a real address in the system. And it took this person almost a month to, um, to fix the issue. And now because, let's see, that just jumped right out of there, said, um, because it wasn't showing up as a real address, it was not, it wouldn't let them redo the application. They had to redo the application. And then the suggestion was that uh, maybe USDA could advocate to help organizations in rural areas resolve this issue. So uh, time is not wasted on the phone with Dunn's and Sam's to fix it because the rural address is not functioning properly. Okay, yeah, we understand that um, Sam uh, doesn't always, um, and I, I've had um, you know, other instances where it wasn't the address, but maybe the entity, and there was some things to straighten out, and um, uh, that's where we tell people to, you know, not two days ahead of the application time uh, start work with Sam uh, because it can get involved and in some cases it, it has gotten involved and um, I um, we, we understand that there have been uh, challenges with registering for Sam but um, the regulation has it that Sam is our uh, means of determining if the entity that's applying has been uh, barred from uh, federal procurement activities. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And that was why I brought that up um, at the end of your presentation. I remember um, when as we, you did presentations last year, um, you recommended to applicants the first thing to do is get their SAMs and DUNS number because sometimes there is a delay. So thank you for covering that and I appreciate the comment. Sher Sherry, do we have any other um, questions or Scott, do we have any more hands raised? Um, nothing through the hand raise. And nothing in the uh, question box. Okay. Um, okay. Bill, let me, first of um, all, let me have note a closing that, comment. Yeah, let me note a couple of things. Um, I've got a slide. Um, our management team is around in Washington. You can get to um, that type of information. Um, we also would encourage you to communicate with the uh, local general field representative in your area. Uh, they can provide answers to technical questions. There's also a help email address that gets a very rapid response. You can type an email to that and that gets you an answer as well. Um, because this is a competitive grant program, uh, we, uh, the um, employees of the agency are restricted. Um, we can um, assist with technical questions, with general information. Um, however, we cannot review a specific application, uh, nor can we assist in the preparation of a specific application because it's a competitive program. So um, you have to respect our, our limitations that are there, um, but we're encouraging in this program, um, there's limited amounts of money, um, there is competition for that money. Um, why we're here today and next Tuesday is our interest um, in this southern region. Um, all of the GFRs, we live here, we work here, um, we see challenges that are here, and we also know in this part of the country, we score very well. Um, so that's a, a good thing to encourage people to put together um, applications that are well thought out, that are complete. Um, sit down with the application guide, if it's in the application guide, um, we're serious about needing that information. So um, uh, don't shortcut things or um, assume we know all about what you're all about. 
um, be descriptive. Um, uh, you don't have to make this uh, application be like a, um, a huge uh, project of verbiage. Um, you don't want to use verbiage where the reviewer has to look up every other word in the dictionary to see what it is. Um, but you can be just um, very practical in your presentation, but be sure you're complete in your presentation. Um, so here's our um, agency contacts. Um, here's who I am. Um, and uh, you can um, uh, also, uh, I guess, uh, remember me that, yeah, we saw you in a pres presentation one day, um, but um, uh, rely on your local general field representative for your information. Um, with that, Steve, I'll turn it back to you. Steve, are you still there? Before Steve closes us out, if you don't mind, we had another question just pop up okay. and okay. We'll, uh, we'll address that. Are the applications reviewed by staff or peer review? We do an internal review. Um, um, each year we have panels of uh, reviewers that uh, there's two parts to the review. Um, there's an eligibility review. Um, and then once that is done, there's a general scoring review. And then that scoring is turned over to the administrator. Um, the scoring is, is done in-house. Um, it's kind of fun to note that um, we do get um, politicians that try and figure out where we're at in the scoring and they can't find us. <laughs> So that's that's kind of fun if you're on that side of it, I guess. Um, but um, it's not a political thing; it's just a scoring thing, and um, so that's how it's done. We don't outsource our scoring. Great. That's the oh, last question that we have. Thanks, Bill. Okay. Yes, thank you, Bill. Um, if we don't have any other questions, um, I'll kind of close this out. Uh, thank you for a fantastic presentation, Bill, um, you, as you always have, have done, and I, it's an absolute um, joy to work with you. I want to thank our panel um, of our GFRs today for taking their time and being on, on today's call, and I really want to thank the um, CX team for setting up the platform. The CX team is um, part of the IC, and they are really the ones that were doing the work behind the scenes today to make this presentation move so smoothly. I want to thank Sherry McCarter also for um, doing the question and answer. And um, I'd like to leave, I guess, a couple of things um, with y'all. First of all, um, Sherry McCarter and myself, we, we covered the South for the IC, uh, for the Innovation Center. And um, our, our job is to connect um, partners and connect applicants. And um, if you have a project in your area and you don't really know where to go with it or don't know how to find the right resource, please reach out to Sherry and I. Um, I'm asking Scott to put our contact information in the chat. And um, sometimes you might have a project and rural development has over 42 different programs that fall, they cover rural housing, rural utilities and rural business. And um, we help build communities from the ground up. Um, so we have a lot of different programs, but we have a lot of fantastic partners too. And sometimes we can leverage resources, if it be technical assistance or if it be um, funding resources. So um, please feel free to, to reach out to us. We are here to, um, to cover the South. And um, you know when it comes to the broadband and distance learning, telemedicine program, we're going to refer you to this wonderful um, a panel of, of GFRs. A um, couple um, resources that are coming your way. Um, the reason that when Bill first um, approached me and said, let's do like we did last year and do a virtual presentation on distance learning telemedicine early in the uh, grant, um, um, grant cycle, so that the applicants will have as much time as possible. Um, so Bill and I decided to go ahead and have two um, different DLT Southern Region 
um, meetings in case you couldn't make one and um, um, we're able to make the other one. So we set one up for today and then the other one will be on the 13th, same time. Um, so in, in same channel. So, um, and if, if there's someone that you work with or someone you think, man, I wish they would have been on the call today. I think they could have benefited. Please forward that invite to them. Or sometimes if you're like me, it's just really beneficial to hear things twice. Uh, feel free to attend on the 13th. Um, also, um, Bill mentioned several times that the national um, webinar is going to be available on April the 14th and the and the 21st. Um, or, sorry, 20th, 14th and the 20th. If you have any questions about that, um, feel free to to reach out to us on that. Um, I'd like to thank the partners, applicants, and also I noticed that there was a lot of the um, congressional delegation that was on, and they work with their constituents to. Um, make these programs available. So we want to recognize them and, and, and appreciate them for being on the on the call today. Uh, rural development is an equal um, equal opportunity provider and we are here to assist all. So feel free to reach out to us. And I want to thank everyone for their attendance and participation on today's call. So with that, I guess we're going to conclude. Feel free to, to reach out to us if you have any questions.